Okay, so I wanted, um, before going into the Amitabha sadhana in more detail, to talk a little bit more generally about the practice and where it fits in. So uh, it's usually considered a sutra practice, although I think it's also tantra because we there is an initiation into it. Um, but when we do the front generation Amitabha practice, then everybody can do that. And it's good uh, when you do it to have some basis in uh, the determination to be free from samsara, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness. In other words, it's not a practice that you uh, walk into as a baby beginner without understanding the Bo- the Buddhist worldview or the Buddha's um, idea of how, uh, you know, spiritual transformation occurs. Because if we just walk into it um, straight off the street, especially people from theistic, uh, who had theistic religions, you know, when they were little, then it looks like you're just substituting Amitabha for God. And uh, and then because you lack the whole philosophical underpinnings and the and the Buddhist perspective, then you don't get the same result, and uh, it can even become more confusing for you, you know, because then you're wondering, maybe if I practice Amitabha, God isn't happy, and if I practice my theistic religion, Amitabha, isn't happy, and, you know, I mean, people's minds can get quite confused. So it needs some some basis uh, so that you know what Buddhist practice is about. Okay, so this practice of Amitabha um, is in all the Mahayana countries, you know, so in Tibet, in China, uh, Japan, Vietnam, Taiwan, and so forth. It's a very popular one. Um, And it's done slightly differently in the different countries, uh, you know, according to their usual philosophical perspective and so on. Um, So, for example, in Japan, there's much, much emphasis on Amitabha as an external being. And, uh, you know, they talk about liberation um, due to self-effort and liberation due to the effort of others. So in Japan, it's very much doing this practice with the attitude of liberation from others, meaning that by relying on Amitabha, um, Amitabha will liberate you. Yeah. Whereas in Tibetan Buddhism, and I think more so in, in Chinese Buddhism, then it's very much um, we have to do the transformation ourselves, you know. And so the practice is a help, and Amitabha's enlightening activities benefit us, but, uh, you know, the effort, the transformation comes uh, mostly from ourselves. So it's just different emphases, and some of these emphases depend on the historical period when the Amitabha practice was brought into a particular country. And uh, so, for example, in, in China, and then especially in Japan, it was brought in at times of great difficulty with a lot of social upheaval. upheaval. And um, when you bring it into a populace, or a population where there isn't widespread literacy, then uh, you want to, you know, the, the people need something to sustain them through those difficult historical times, and you need to make it simple so that they can remember it because they can't read, yeah? And so in ancient times, this was the case not only in Asia, but all throughout the world, you know? There were certain classes of people that read, but but not others. So so it's quite different now, yeah? But uh, I think it, to some extent it was very simplified in those difficult times so that it can be, could become a very widespread practice, yeah, which helped people, okay? 
Um, so this practice, you don't need to be some high-level bodhisattva to do. It's something that we ordinary beings can do. Uh, and so we shouldn't, you know, think oh, you know, like that, okay? Um, so a lot of this practice involves creating the cause to be reborn in Amitabha's Pure Land, which is called Sukhavati, or in Tibetan, Dewa Chen. It means the land of great bliss. And, uh, and the idea of getting reborn there is that all the circumstances uh, for Dharma practice are very conducive in Sukhavati. So, you know, you don't have to work to go to work. You don't have to pay taxes. Um, you don't uh, have, you know, there aren't problemistic family situations because nobody's born in a family. You're born in lotuses instead. Um, you know, so, and and then the whole environment is very conducive. There's Buddhas all around. The, they say that the wind that blows through the trees teaches the Dharma. Um, Amitabha's there. You have everything you could possibly need, you know, and you, so you don't have to go looking for for food or clothing or medicine or shelter and the environment's very hospitable, the ground is soft, uh, no thorns, no, they're not building a smelter, um, you know, there's no climate change. Uh, so, you know, you don't need to get involved in, in a lot of social activities. You can really focus on your practice. And so that's the, the benefit of being reborn there. And His Holiness really emphasizes that the motivation to be born there must be a bodhicitta motivation. If your motivation to be reborn there is just so I won't go to the lower realms, because once you're born in Sukhavati, you're no, although you aren't free from samsara, yet you also aren't in samsara, and you can't get reborn in the lower realms after that. So, but if that's your motivation for being reborn there, I don't want to be reborn in the lower realms, and I'm just looking out for me, then His Holiness is not at all in approval of that kind of attitude and motivation for doing the practice. You know, similarly thinking that if you do the POA and uh, that doing POA and getting some signs on the top of your head and things like that, that just doing that is enough to secure a good rebirth. You don't have to do anything else. Also, His Holiness does not have much respect for that kind of attitude. His attitude is very much, you know, what he always says, uh, we're the ones who created the problems, so we're the ones who have to change and fix our problems. Yeah, and it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves and to take care of other sentient beings and not to just look for, you know, quick, cheap, and easy um, way to our own personal enlightenment uh, so that we can have a nice nap afterwards. Yeah, he often says that, you know, how he thought when he started practicing, oh, I'll attain awakening and then I can have a nice sleep and relax. So, you know, this is not the attitude <laughs> that he advocates, okay? So, in relation to our world, Sukhavati's in the west. Um, you know, Akshobhya's pure land is in the east. Yeah, um, They'd say it's very, very far away. I haven't heard the distance in light years, so please don't ask me that question. Um, but, and it also isn't perceivable by our eyes or our, our gross senses. Okay, it is perceivable by the mind because, of course, it's the mind that takes rebirth in Sukhavati. And so we start that process by visualizing Amitabha's pure land and visualizing, you know, uh, being in it now because what we aspire to and what we familiarize ourselves with now creates our experience in the future. 
you know, in the same way that our actions create our experience in the future, you know, generating the the intention, the aspiration to be reborn in Sukhavati repeatedly puts that in our mind in a very deep way. And then hopefully when we die, since we're creatures of habit, that aspiration will again arise very strongly at the time of death. And then that will uh, propel us um, into rebirth at, in Sukhavati. Okay, um, so the <coughs> the realization or the actualization of any pure land, Sukhavati or, or any other, is not without causes. It's not just magic, okay? But like everything else, it's a dependent arising. And so here, um, in particular, it one of the chief causes... Uh, is Amitabha's unshakable resolve to establish this kind of pure land. So before he was Amitabha Buddha, he was um, a bodhisattva monk named Dhammakara. And so as all bodhisattvas do, he thought about how best to benefit sentient beings. And, and what he thought was, there's so many pure lands who exist um, uh, but they can't be reached by people unless they abandon non-virtue. Okay, so you have to somehow be a, an above-average person to be born in these other pure lands. You have to have created a great deal of merit, assiduously studied the Dharma, done a lot of purifications, and uh, otherwise you can't reach those other pure lands. And so... Uh, Dhammakara was very concerned with it, about this. He said, what about, you know, the average Joe Blow who, you know, has negativities and hasn't done that much practice and, you know, still needs some help. And so, mm, you know, with a lot of compassion for ordinary beings, he made these unshakable resolves. Remember in the, when we make the six perfections into ten, one of them is unshakable resolve. So, you know, he made these unshakable resolves. And, uh, and so, depending on those unshakable resolves, he was able to create this pure land because a lot of those resolves have to do with who can be reborn in his pure land, what the pure land's going to be like, and so forth. But it's not just Amitabha's unshakable resolves that established it. Of course, it's also due to his accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom. Okay, so those two collections of merit and pristine wisdom are also essential for a Buddha in order to create uh, this kind of place where we ordinary beings can uh, can be reborn. And so he had you know, this such a strong intention to liberate living beings, you know, by creating a pure land where ordinary beings, uh, instead of Aryas, could be reborn. And what's interesting, uh, there are some Aryas born in Sukhavati. The here um, Aryas are born there, okay? So many of them, you know, they attain uh, Arhatship, and then, you know... Uh, they ha so that is nirvana with the remainder of their coarse body, and then when they pass away, they uh, have the re you know nirvana without the remainder of their afflictive body, and so many of them are born at that time in uh, Sukhavati. I don't know if all of them are born there. I think just some of them are born there, but. There's nine different kinds of lotuses in Sukhavati. And what kind of lotus you're born in and how soon that lotus opens depends a lot on your mental state. Yeah. So these, the, uh, uh, the, the Shravakas, the here Arhats, are born in lotuses that are closed yeah, because they lack the bodhicitta. And so it, you know, they still require. They're they're in their meditative emptiness, uh, meditation on, 
on nirvana and the emptiness of all phenomena, but the Buddhas have to wake them up and tell them to generate bodhicitta, and then after they generate bodhicitta, their lotuses will open. You know, in the same way, there can be some people, like if you create very heavy negative actions, like the five heinous actions, then uh, usually that's a direct ticket to, to the hell realms. But if somebody engages in Amitabha practice and practices very well and does a lot of purification, they can still be reborn in Sukhavati. Um, you know, but again, in not in a fully opened, resplendent um, uh, lotus because they still have a lot of, to do, a lot of purification. And similarly, people who have doubt, they may pray to be reborn in Sukhavati, but, you know, can I really, does this really have, you know, then that also, they can still be reborn there, but again, in a lotus that, you know, isn't, completely fully opened and radiant. But even if you're born in a closed right lotus, you're there. It's like, you know, getting on the last plane out of Iraq before, you know, something happened. I mean, well, the people fleeing Vietnam, you know, it's like getting on the last plane out of Vietnam before everything, you know, fell apart. Uh, you're still there. You still get born in Sukhavati. But, you know, there's some work to do and, and things to happen first before you can uh, benefit as much as you, as you want to from it. So I think I'll stop there for right now and then continue later, but it gives you some idea about that.